And we're back now with the CNC table. That is not quite a CNC table yet, but let's go over all these uh, changes I made and just how much better this new system is with a spindle motor attached. So the biggest change this time compared to the previous upgrade is the motor itself. So instead of going with a handheld router like I previous have, this one is a spindle motor, which is going to be permanently attached to it. The thing with these are, they are just motors. There's no bells and whistles on them compared to the routers, which means this being all motor, all the power it takes in is going straight into the actual cutting action itself. So no matter what I throw at this thing, it is just going to shred it. And it's a three phase, 3.5 kilowatt thing. So it's an absolute beast of a motor. When it comes to extraction this time as well, instead of having it cover the entire motor like I did last time, we've actually got it mounted on the front. I personally didn't like it covering the whole thing in the previous design as it was actually pulling dust into the motor. But with this one, we can't do that as the airflow on this, it pulls air down through it and obviously the extractor pulls air up. So if we did that, there'd be a conflict in the airflow, which would then cause the motor to overheat, which I really don't want to get this thing overheating. It gets hot enough as it is. The cover itself then, this time is held on by four screws, two on each side which have a slot in them, which allows it to be slid up and down. This is for different size uh, cutters that I put on it. It needs to be adjustable as if it's longer, then I'll need to lower the cover down to ensure maximum extraction on it to limit the amount of dust. Another thing is with this cover, which I, was a problem with my last one. If I want to change the actual cutter itself, I've got to try and get a spanner up there, find it and do it at an angle. And I cannot guarantee that I'm going to get enough grip on there to actually tighten it up properly, which then gives a risk of the whole thing flying off. So now all I've got to do <laughs> here is unscrew that. Just left the one screw in and then the whole thing just pops off there. So now I can easily get access to that and change it properly and ensure it's all done because I don't want that thing flying off. For those wondering on this, why I don't just do the slots longer, the thing is that whole thing has a lot of pull on it from the extraction pipes itself. And if I do them long, those slots longer, um, I'm weakening this. So there could be a chance of it breaking. And the last thing I want is that thing snapping and being pulled under into the cutter itself while it's in motion, because all sorts of things could go wrong. It doesn't, it's just four screws to change it, and the cutter barely gets changed that often, so nice and simple this way. I've also, along with the other changes, changed the bearings on this now. We previously had two bearings per rail on this, but as this new one weighs 10 kilos and has a lot more power to it, we kind of figured that uh, there's a lot more vibration that could possibly go into them. So we've got four of these per rail, with each one being rated for 1,300 newtons of force. It's like 130-ish uh, kilos each. So yeah, it's way overkill, but I need the overkill to handle the extra vibration. And also it means there's some redundancy should one of them fail. The cool thing about spindle motors then is as they are just a motor, as I said earlier, it means that they have to have separate control systems to actually run them. So here is the actual control panel that I've got for it. This connects to a variable frequency drive, which we've got under the table itself. And it's basically just a computer that allows you to change a lot of the power aspects of the motor itself. There's a lot of different buttons on this thing. All I personally care about is the on and off there. But originally, the way you change the speed was by these two buttons here, went up and down, which caused problems initially, because obviously I can't see the speed that it's going at on the display. So I was guessing what the speed was going at based on the sound the motor was going at. So we changed that instead to this dial here. So at the moment that would be at zero. And when it's on, I normally, for the certain bit I'm using, go to about there which would be 150 hertz approximately, which would be 9,000 RPM. And if it goes all the way to the end there, 
that would be 300 hertz, which equates to uh, 18,000 RPM, maths. And also, with a major problem I did have initially, was this button here. This is a reverse button. So you really don't want to use your uh, router cutters in reverse. As, uh, as I found out, it, it really didn't go well. So we've instead made it, so if I accidentally press that now, so set reverse mode on, and if I press the power button, the power mode will turn on, but it won't actually activate the spindle motor as it's disabled it, so I don't actually cause damage to anything again. So turn that off, press that again. There's a lot of different things you can do with this as well. Technically, I can make the buttons do any di different type of program I want. So if I wanted, I could literally have it so I press any of these buttons here and it could activate a specific speed I want. But for now, we're going to leave it as it is. Maybe at some point we'll get it to start playing some music with the motor. Apparently that's a thing you can do. But we'll get on to actually using this thing then. So I've got a nice slab of Western Hemlock in place on the table now. I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but it is quite uneven as it's been taken fresh from the saw mill and put through my kiln. Uh, another change I've made before we continue is on the end here, I actually cut it lower so I can use it as a stopper for the slabs. This is so that I can actually use more of the table surface itself, but also it means I don't have to worry about running into anything when I'm over the end here as what I was having to be concerned about before was actually running into the top of that. So doing it this way, more table surface and less to worry about when I'm in use. Uh, here also, as you can see, as this slab has twisted slightly, I've shimmed up the corners to try and take out any wobble of it. Come up to this end here. I'm gonna put this block into the table so that'll wedge it against the other end. So I'll put one screw in one at a slightly angle out, leave it in, and put that in, and that ensures that it's pre uh, held in place, stop any movement, because again, there's no point in trying to get this all accurate if this thing's going to be moving as I'm going. So, me. There we go. Uh, not like that. Not there. And there we go. Now it's stuck. I just need to drop the height of this down now then. A key important note is when using the machine, if I'm starting from this side of the slab, what I want to do is push the machine away from me and then start coming across. If I start from the other end and pull it towards me, what happens is the motor will start to pull itself across. I believe it's called a climb cut which that uh, puts more strain on the motor as well as giving a rough cut. So yeah, if I'm starting here, I wanna push it away from me. When I come to this side, then I want to start pulling the machine towards me when I wanna do a return cut. So just get the height drop now, should be about 10 mil. Again, these here are about five mil per full turn. So, There we go, that feels about right. Just up that slightly, there we go. Just in case. All right, let's get this thing turned on then.
I've just done one pass on this then and you can't tell through a camera but this just gives a beautiful finish it's almost sanded uh, it's just it really feels nice um, on this corner I don't know how much it came up on the camera but I could tell that it was going to be getting deeper over here and I think it got to about eight mil that the cutter was taking off in height so it's always when doing the first cut just in case you've got the things like this just be a little bit more careful I have a 50 millimeter spoil board cutter on it and I was taking off 20 mil on each pass. That was mainly because of this part because I didn't know how soon it was going to start. But on the next pass I do, I'll probably take off about 40 mil per each pass on the way back. As I just need to take off probably another mil in height to get all these out. But at the moment that surface, what you can see is all perfectly flat. So it will not take much to finish this off now. Personally, I think we've got the extraction on this pretty spot on now. There's barely any dust in here. So I can't really complain about that. But uh, I did get thinking with this uh, powerful motor we've got right now. 50 mil just it seems a bit small for it. I mean, I can push it harder, surely. But, uh, you know, that's, that's not something I'd do anytime soon, I think. Anyway, like and subscribe and check out the uh, website visionlessdesigns.com to help support the channel and I hope to see you in future videos.